Special thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring today's video. Hello guys, Winston here. Ever since I built my first CNC machine back in 2014, I have been a huge proponent of subtractive manufacturing. Adding a desktop scale CNC to my arsenal added so much context and meaning to my 6 plus years of engineering education that had given me a ton of theoretical knowledge with very little practical experience. I was suddenly empowered to not just build things at home cobbling parts together willy-nilly, but to actually design them with intent and to iterate and improve them with a precision that an untrained maker could only achieve with computer assistance. In those first few years with my Shapeoko 2, and then the Shapeoko 3s, and then a Nomad and a Pocket NC, forcing myself to grapple with the strengths and weaknesses of milling machines by always thinking about my projects subtractively gave me a deep understanding and appreciation for what these machines were capable of. That old saying, when all you have's a hammer, every problem looks like a nail, truly applied to me. Sometimes it meant I was making my own life a little harder. Certain things are inherently difficult to machine and that meant I needed to think creatively and push the limits of what I knew how to do, and I am forever grateful that I challenged myself to do that. But as I mentioned a few weeks ago, I reached a point where I was no longer interested in working within a very narrow band of manufacturing techniques. At some point, the hardship of restricting your options outweighs the educational benefits, and because of that, I allowed myself to start shopping for 3D printers. Now, I glossed over this in my CNC enclosure lighting video, mainly because I didn't think anyone would be interested, but I did get a few questions about what printer I got and why. So here were my guiding requirements. 1. Affordability. I really didn't want to spend a ton of money on something new when I didn't know how often I would be using it. A printer being under $1,000 was a firm requirement, with my reluctance to clicking the purchase button on Amazon decreasing exponentially below $600. I got the Ender 5 Pro for just about $400, and for that price it is an insane value. With just a small amount of tweaking you'll get some shockingly okay quality prints. It won't compete with a machine 3 or 4 times the cost, but it will produce very respectable results that will hold their own in the sub 4 figure price bracket. Criteria number 2 was size. I didn't want anything with a build area smaller than 8 by 8 inches, but build area was only part of my size requirement. Footprint was another big factor. My workbenches are all shoved up against walls and space overall is very limited. I didn't want a printer that needed a lot of extra room in front or behind it. That ruled out big moving bed printers like the CR10. So I was mostly cross shopping the Ender 3 and Ender 5 families as well as the Prusa kit. There were a couple nice things like the silent stepper driver in the Ender 5 Pro that put it over the Ender 3 and regular Ender 5 for me, and sure you could upgrade those yourselves, but I wanted to do as little invasive surgery as possible, especially with this being my first printer. It just seemed like a nice happy medium among the choices on the market, and I'll tell you right now that I have no regrets. Could I have bought a slightly more expensive printer with auto bed leveling? Yes. Did I want to spend more money on a printer when I wasn't sure I would enjoy having a printer at all? No. There's plenty more you can dive into, like using different beds like build tack or glass, and adhesion aids like glue sticks or blue tape or hairspray. Honestly, I can't be bothered. The stock magnetic bed actually works quite well, and the flexibility of it makes part removal super easy. But again, this all assumes you've properly leveled the platform. It's like tramming a CNC. The reliability of your printer depends on it. Also, keep everything clean. So now that you understand the history of my reluctance to embrace 3D printing and my choice of printer, let's go over how I prepared my Ender 5 Pro for life in this subtractive manufacturing stronghold. There were two things I wanted to achieve with some basic printer modifications. The first was to enclose the printer on at least all four sides. This would prevent gusts of wind that would frequently pass through my garage from causing large temperature fluctuations across the print bed. It would also help keep those same breezes from depositing dust on the print bed which could negatively affect my printing experience. The second objective was to clean up all the wiring, and though you could perhaps zip tie them directly to the frame, I thought that would look a little ugly, and it would also interfere with the walls that I would be installing, but let's address that later. To skin my Ender 5 I would be using 1 16th inch polycarbonate. Fortunately, I bought this stuff a few weeks before COVID-19 really kicked PPE production into high gear, and clear plastics went out of stock everywhere. I sketched up some panels that would slot into the extrusion frames with cutouts for the motors and wiring that needed to pass through the walls. 
The front of the enclosure would sport double doors because I had yet to settle on a home for my printer, and I didn't want a big panel of polycarbonate to be swinging out into my narrow walkway in my garage. Polycarbonate is pretty easy to cut, especially if you have some plastic-specific end mills. For most of my cuts, I'm using an Amana 8th inch single flute end mill, which, <clears throat> shameless plug, Carbide 3D sells as part of a plastic cutting end mill kit. Feed rate was a fairly conservative 40 inches per minute with a conservative 1mm step down just to infuriate both the Imperial and metric camps. RPM was in the neighborhood of 15 to 16,000. I really wasn't too particular about the setting on the router. Now, you may conclude seeing the footage that I was perhaps a bit too stingy with my double sided tape, and you are 100% correct. But I also didn't want to use clamps and tabs here, so a little manual assistance was required to keep the polycarbonate from being yanked off my table. Once these panels were cut out, I slotted the sides and back walls into the frame. For the door, I needed hinges, which I modeled in Fusion and printed. These hinges were more or less symmetrical or mirrored, except that the bottom half of the hinge was sealed off so the hinge pin wouldn't fall out. I designed the hinge to accept an 8th inch pin since I could use a drill bit to achieve a snug fit. 3D printed holes can't be trusted to be tight tolerance. The hinges were attached to the printer frame and polycarbonate doors with number 6 fasteners. For hinge pins, I found that the most readily available source of high precision 8th inch diameter shafts was my collection of broken end mills. The irony is not lost on me that my 3D printer modifications are held together by my failures of subtractive manufacturing. A couple printed door poles completed the enclosure of my Ender 5 Pro. Now for a bit of cleanup. I iterated on a design for 3D printed cable tie anchors that would snap into the extrusions, eventually coming up with a profile that would hold securely in the channels while being removable later if necessary. That profile was also used to make some stops for my doors. I also printed some clips to keep pressure on my polycarbonate panels. That 1 16th inch plastic is much thinner than the channel width so they would tend to rattle around while the printer was accelerating. Installing these clips every 3 inches or so quieted things down substantially. And with those changes, Elmer the Ender was properly cleaned up and ready for service. The name Elmer of course refers to Elmer Fudd, someone who is all too easy to make out to be the villain but is ultimately a good guy at heart. I'll have an Amazon link in the description to the Ender 5 Pro if you're in the market for a good value 3D printer. Do keep in mind that Creality recently updated the Ender 3 with nice things like a touchscreen which is also found on their upcoming machines like the CR6 SE, currently on Kickstarter. I would assume that an upgrade like that wouldn't be far-fetched to see on a refreshed Ender 5 later this year, but in my opinion, that's just a nice-to-have feature and not super essential. The fundamentals of the machine are pretty decent. So far, I've put about 20-30 to 30 hours on this thing and it's been a largely positive experience, though, of course, I still love my CNC milling machines more. Going into my 3D printer acquisition, I had a good bit of dread about the experience, but the more I used it, the more I came to accept it and find out just how useful it could be. Much like my experience redesigning my website with Squarespace. Squarespace gives you the tools to get your website off the ground quickly with powerful and easy to use designs and templates. You can build stylish web pages with rich text, images, or embedded media for whatever you want to share, be it a blog, a portfolio, or maybe a listing of all the digital fabrication machines under your care and how awesome they are. Every website design also automatically includes a unique mobile optimized experience that matches the overall style of your website, so your content will look great on all devices all the time. So head over to Squarespace to start a 14 day free trial and see how it can help you build an awesome site quickly. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash Winston Moy to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. I want to thank you all very much for watching, despite the fact that this wasn't a very machining heavy video, but I will be back soon to cleanse the palette with more CNC projects and DIY nonsense that definitely won't include any 3D printing whatsoever.